What's up everyone? Just like with our last video, we're going to look at data from the 2021 NFL season to find some value picks in your fantasy football drafts. But this time, we're looking at wide receivers. First, let's start off with our process for identifying these wide receivers with value. During my analysis, I found that touches and receptions are more correlated with fantasy points than targets are. Touches having a higher correlation confused me at first until I realized the effect that Debo Samuel was having on the data set. When he's eliminated from this set, fantasy point correlation with receptions is actually the highest. So since receptions are more correlated with success than targets, how can we identify players with higher potential for receptions than the fantasy community is currently giving them credit for? The answer is through using catch rate. Essentially, we can identify the players with above average catch rates that are also going to see high target volume or an increase in targets from last season. But first, let's look at two more charts to fully establish our approach. First, there is no correlation between catch rate and targets, which is key for our approach. If there was any correlation here, there would be zero opportunity for us finding value in hunting receptions over targets, because it would mean that players with lower target volume will inherently have lower receptions, which isn't necessarily true. This also shows that just because a player is getting a lot of targets doesn't mean that they will get receptions, which is our key indicator for season-long success. Second, catch rate is highly correlated to fantasy football success. This is also important because it means that the variable that we are using to predict receptions is separately indicative of fantasy football success as well. So what wide receivers are great value picks in your draft? Let's start with the top end assets. Cooper Cup, Chris Godwin, and Hunter Renfro. Cup is easy. There's a reason he's ranked as the second overall player in ESPN drafts. His production is insane. He has an amazing catch rate of 76% and his target share isn't going to drastically change from last season. The other quick one is Godwin, who had a 77% catch rate last season and is currently ranked as the 46th overall player in the wide receiver 21. His late season ACL tear means that he's going to miss the start of the season, but the exact timetable is still uncertain. However, he was the wide receiver 13 last year despite missing the last three games. To read straight out of his ESPN bio, he's been no worse than 15th in points per game each of the last three seasons and no worse than 4th in catch rate each of the last three seasons. You're getting Godwin at a discount because of his injury, which is something I love in fantasy drafts, and if you can survive in the early part of the season without him, your team can be dangerous come playoff time. Real quick before we move on to Renfro, I also want to point out Russell Gage, who Tampa Bay signed. He has a great catch rate of 70% and is a solid late round target at 108 overall in wide receiver 47. He should have some standalone value, but he's going to be most valuable for a team that's rostering Godwin and needs some help while he's recovering. Now let's talk about Hunter Renfro. Renfro is admittedly a little bit of an enigma. I probably spent the most time trying to figure out his value while researching for this video. So to start off, everyone knows that Devontae Adams has entered the picture in Las Vegas and is going to eat up a lot of targets. But what people aren't talking about are the targets that left the Raiders this offseason. Zay Jones, Brian Edwards, and Henry Ruggs combined for 165 targets last season and are all gone. Now, the Raiders did bring in Demarcus Robinson, but he isn't much of a target hog. If we assume he gets about the same 40 targets that he did last season, that means there are still 125 targets available in this offense. Now, Devontae isn't going to get the 170 targets he got last year. Rodgers has had no one to throw to in Green Bay for a long time. So just like Devontae will eat the targets in the Raiders' offense, Waller and Renfro are also going to bring down Devontae's share too. But let's say Devontae takes over all of those 125 targets, which is reasonable for a player of his caliber. Then, let's also say that Renfro loses 28 more targets to Waller playing a full season, which he didn't last year. That leaves Renfro with about 100 targets, with which his 81% catch rate means 81 receptions. Using his yards per reception from last year and a return to the mean in the touchdown department, he would post 81 receptions for 818 yards and 4 TDs. That would result in about 187 fantasy points, placing him at wide receiver 29 last year. Now, I understand that isn't super exciting, but that's exactly where you would be drafting Renfro. He's currently ranked 58th overall and exactly as the wide receiver 29. The Raiders' targets this season are going to be heavily concentrated between Adams, Waller, and Renfro, which means Renfro's targets shouldn't drastically decrease. And even with a dip in target share, Renfro's catch rate means that he can still return value where you're currently picking him at. 
And while I usually don't like drafting players at their price, Renfro is a safe asset, and depending on your league format, that could be very worthwhile. Now let's talk about those late-round dart throws with a lot of upside. First off is Christian Kirk. Kirk is currently ranked 90th overall and has the wide receiver 42 in ESPN drafts. That's insanely low for a player who should be the wide receiver one on his team and boasts a great 75% catch rate. Now, obviously, the question is how will that catch rate change now that he steps out of the shadow of DeAndre Hopkins? Ultimately, I think that primarily comes down to Trevor Lawrence's performance this season. So while I don't expect Kirk to be a target monster, with his catch rate, he doesn't need to be. And at his price, there's a lot of upside, even if that catch rate does dip a little bit, considering he could earn a large share of the targets in the Jacksonville offense. Next, we have the headache in Kansas City. Unlike the Raiders, where I think the targets will be concentrated among Renfro, Waller, and Adams, I think the Chiefs are going to spread the ball around a lot. But the question remains, who has the most value out of Juju, Sky Moore, McCole Hardman, and MVS? Ignoring last season, Juju averages a solid 69% catch rate, which means he might have some value at 69 overall and wide receiver 34. Sky Moore is currently 112 overall and wide receiver 51, but is also a massive question mark. I think he's talented, but I have no idea how quick he will see the field or how Kansas City intends to use him. The only thing I know for certain is that ESPN is completely wrong in their rankings of McCole Hardman and Marquez Valdez Scantling. They're currently ranked right next to each other at 127 and 128 overall, so wide receiver 56 and 57 respectively. People still seem to think that McCole Hardman is a deep threat decoy like MVS is, but that isn't true anymore. Hardman's average depth of target has decreased every year since his rookie season, down from 11 to 7.4. However, MVS is still that decoy. His ADOT last season was 17.9. Just to give you an idea, Tyreek Hill's average ADOT during his four years in Kansas City was 12.8. While an ADOT as high as MVS's can lead to value in an offense led by Patrick Mahomes, generally it's a sign that a player just isn't going to get the targets to support season-long success. Add on top of that, Scantling's poor 47% catch rate, and he just isn't someone I'm touching in my drafts. By comparison, Hardman had a 71% catch rate last season and has seen his targets increase every year. The other benefit with Hardman is that you should know by week three the role he's going to be playing in this offense, which means if he underperforms, you can easily dump him. He has high upside on draft day with a minimal cost, and you can dump him for an upstart free agent if he doesn't have a consistent role. Whereas with someone like Juju, you know he's going to have a somewhat consistent role in this offense, so he has a much higher floor, but he could be just good enough that you can't drop him if he underperforms and also has a much higher cost. I'm planning a general draft strategy video that will discuss that concept more and how you should only be chasing upside in the late rounds of your draft, so be on the lookout for that in the future. But with that said, let's talk about the last two players for this video, Rashad Bateman and Devin DuVernay. Both are the same story. 237 targets have left the Ravens via the departure of Marquise Brown, Sammy Watkins, and Devonta Freeman. Rashad Bateman is the presumed wide receiver one in this offense with a solid catch rate of 68% and has insane upside for his current price of wide receiver 38 and 75th overall. DuVernay has a better catch rate at 70%, but is expecting to see less targets as he competes for the wide receiver 2 spot in the Ravens offense. That said, his price is extremely cheap at wide receiver 89 and 233 overall. Realistically, in a 10 or even 12-man league, you could just leave DuVernay on the waiver wire and pick him up after week 1 if he performs well. But... Both DuVernay and Bateman have great upside in this offense with the targets that are currently available. The only obstacle in their path is Mark Andrews, who boasts a 70% catch rate and could potentially soak up even more targets and have one of the best tight end seasons of all time this upcoming year. That's it for the video, though. I hope this helps you guys out with your draft, and if you found any part of this video valuable, please leave a like and subscribe, or let me know in the comments where you disagree with me. Thank you so much for watching, and have a good one.